Hello, and welcome to today's program, Korean Soft Power. My name is Jonathan Corrado. I'm the policy director here at the Korea Society. We're so happy that you all are able to join us. We've got a bunch of great responses, over 250 people RSVP'd from around the world and very fitting for this topic. Uh, and I think this topic really needs no introduction, but I'm gonna do just a little bit of table setting here. Uh, we're all used to the term soft power, which describes a country's ability to exert influence through attraction rather than coercion. Uh, and hard power, of course, is the opposite of that. Joseph Nye uses the term smart power to describe an effective mix of both of these approaches. Powered by the Hallyu or Korean wave, the growth in size, complexity, and impact of Korea soft power seems to be limitless. These days, people all over the world know and like Korean cultural content. You'll find army members just about anywhere you look. And today we're gonna to try to talk about how that cultural influence has developed over time, where it's going in the future, and how, if at all, it could be leveraged to help advance Korea's national interests. Lucky thing for us, uh, we've got a fantastic panel who know way more than I do about all this stuff. They have expertise on Korean music, film, television, education, as well as the larger international system within which Korea operates. It's my pleasure to introduce them Dr. John DeLore is professor of Chinese studies at Yonsei University Graduate School of International Studies, where he's chair of the program in international studies. As many of you know, Professor DeLore is co-author with Orville Shell of the fantastic book, Wealth and Power, China's Long March to the 21st Century. John is based in Seoul, and you can find his writing in places such as Foreign Affairs, The New York Times, Asian Survey, and Journal of Asian Studies. Welcome, John. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Jonathan. Great to be with everyone. <clears throat> Next up is Victoria Kim, former LA Times correspondent, who is soon to be correspondent for the New York Times in Seoul. She previously wrote for the Associated Press out of South Korea and West Africa, as well as for the Financial Times right here where we're based in New York City. Victoria was raised in Seoul and graduated from Harvard University with a degree in history. She's written a lot of compelling articles about this very topic, so we are so delighted that she's able to join us. Thanks for joining us today, Victoria. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Of course. Bernie Cho is the president of DFSB Collective, a soul based artist and label services agency that specializes in providing digital media, marketing, and distribution services to 1,500 plus Korean pop music artists. DFSB Collective collaborates with artists and their management companies to devise customized strategies to connect them to their local and global fans. Bernie is a frequent commentator in the media about Hallyu, and I've learned a lot from his appearances already. Welcome to the program, Bernie. Good morning here, and uh, I think good afternoon or good evening over there in New York. That's right. Yeah, sun has set. Uh, and last but certainly not least, Jenna Gibson, PhD candidate at the Department of Political Science at the University of Chicago in the subfield of international relations. If you're a fan of this intersection between Hallyu and Korean diplomacy, you've probably seen Jenna's great work. She's written about Korean politics and social issues for foreign policy and PR as a contributor to the diplomat. And I encourage you to check out Jenna's great piece on this very topic for the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Welcome to the program, Jenna. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. Uh, and thank you to our virtual audience for joining us today. Uh, I think the fact that we got so many of you to join us today is a testament to the strength of today's speakers and the compelling nature of the topic as well. Uh, before we start, I want to remind you that we are taking questions live, so you can send those in now and throughout the program to policy at koreasociety.org. We already received a bunch of those, and we have saved time at the end to convey them to our speakers. Without further ado, we're going to get things started, and Bernie, the first question goes to you. As the president of DFSB Collective, you help bring K-pop artists to new emerging and established fan bases all over the world. Can you tell us why you think K-pop has such a global appeal, how it's evolved, and where you see it going? Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, you know, that, that question alone is actually a, a top of the, the discussion that could easily go on for 50 minutes. But since you said I should try to keep it short, to five minutes, I'm going to try to answer your query with really five key factors fueling uh, this K-pop boom. Um, if I had to give a one-line answer, for instance, if I was stuck in an elevator and had to pitch you really quick why K-pop is so compelling and so popular right now, uh, the one-liner I would probably provide and give 
is that K-pop music is uh, music that you can see with your ears and hear with your eyes. Uh, because K-pop is not just a very oral, but very visual experience. And often a lot that gets lost in translation through the lyrics is often interpreted and then some through the visuals, through music videos, through viral videos. Um, but, you know, uh, going away and moving away from the eye candy aspect of K-pop, uh, I would break down the five key factors behind the K-pop boom as the following. Uh, number one is cultural technology. Number two is globalization. Number three is fandomonia. Uh, number four is collaborations. And number five, actually, in a weird way, and I'll explain why, is uh, Starbucks, <laughs> which I don't have at the moment. Um, now, to, to, to kick things off at number one is cultural technology. Now, these are two words when you place them side by side, really feel almost oxymoronic. But, you know, it's actually in many ways very symbiotic, very symbolic, very synergistic and, and simply genius. Uh, there's a bit of a debate out there as to who coined the phrase. I know Keist has laid claim that they coined the phrase cultural technology. Uh, but if I had to sort of give the sachet or bouquet of flowers or the crown or the invisible trophy as to who really, you know, um, pioneered not just the term, the word, but the concept of cultural technology, I would give that to Chairman Isuman of SM Entertainments. Um, you know, he really, you know, not only um, pitched it, uh, preached it, but more importantly, put it to practice. And what I mean by that is when you look at the evolution or really the revolution behind K-pop, um, technology was often driving uh, the pop culture and obviously the K-pop music. And the K-pop music was also driving the technology. Um, a lot of the growth, a lot of the innovation occurred in the late 90s uh, when, frankly, the Korean economy collapsed during what we call the IMF period. And um, we had another superstar DJ at the time. It wasn't Fatboy Slim, but President Kim Dae Jung. He doubled down on investing in highways, but not of the um, you know, tar and uh, roads, but more the information superhighway. And so when we saw the internet uh, get laid out and really put Korea on a high speed uh, trajectory, where now Korea is widely considered the most wired and wireless country and market and society in the world, uh, what ended up happening was the internet basically uh, accelerated and incubated uh, Korea and K-pop music's move into going international. Um, and when we look at sort of K-pop, you know, I, I've read a lot of fan sites who have really deeply analyzed first, second, third, fourth generation. I'm a little bit more simplistic. I just sort of look at it in terms of phases and blocks. Um, I would say the first phase uh, would be uh, made for Korea. A lot of the K-pop music was made by Korean artists for the Korean music market, just only within Korea. And that I would say was in the 90s. Then we hit the turn of the century. Um, that's when sort of Korea transitioned into what I would call the made in Korea phase, where the music was being made in Korea, but thanks to satellite and cable TV, uh, K-pop music was starting to make waves across Asia, specifically Japan, the greater China region and Southeast Asia. And then from 2010 to 2020, uh, we see the sort of a transition to what I would call the made by Korea phase, where K-pop music was becoming not only more multilingual, more multicultural, but more multinational. When we looked at whether it was the band members speaking different languages and hailing from different countries, um, K-pop was looking and feeling um, very much more international. And so as a result, um, you know, we started seeing uh, having foreign members and K-pop uh, bands becoming the new normal. Um, and then the third thing uh, that I would say is a highlight is what I call fandomonium. Um, you know, one of the things that K-pop has um, inspired and really spurred is a very unique, very passionate, very fervent global fan base. Uh, a lot of it has been driven by social media, whether it's Twitter, um, Instagram, Facebook, especially YouTube um, and TikTok. And then collaborations. We saw a lot of K-pop artists moving from um, creative collaborations to now more than ever, we're starting to see more commercial collaborations between not just big K-pop artists, but big K-pop companies teaming up with big international music companies such as Universal Music. 
Uh, and then last but not least, um, Starbucks. Um, this is one of those things where um, people are wondering, what's he talking about Starbucks? Um, Starbucks really in many ways wasn't just, it was, it's, it's actually a for the win strategy. And what I mean by that is in the early days when I was exporting Korean music, I was really struggling with how can Korean music go across, but more importantly, beyond Asia. And I traveled a lot, but one of my standby go-tos was going to Starbucks, whether it's in Tokyo, obviously Seoul, Shanghai, or, or, or Thailand. And what I noticed, and I looked at the menus, is that one of the reasons why Starbucks coffee sells so well in Asia is language, is what I call metadata, where you had local language and then English side by side. And when I saw that, that was an epiphany for me. Um, so when I started exporting Korean music and many others in the industry are exporting Korean music, we didn't want to throw away or forfeit Korean and just use English to sell more and more importantly, sell out. We felt that there was a way to sell Korean music uh, locally, globally, but more importantly, globally by maintaining Korean and English side by side. And so when people look at K-pop music and wonder why it sells better or more than say J-pop or C-pop or any other Asian music, it has to do with metadata, the marketing, the packaging, local language and English translation side by side. And I figured, you know, if this is what's helping Starbucks sell more coffee in Asia, I need this format. I need this formula. I need this type of type to have my stars make more, make more bucks. And so... Um, when you look at Korean music, it doesn't hit you immediately, but if you look closer, a lot of the songs, a lot of the videos, a lot of the artists, the titles are all Korean and English side by side. And I think that was one of the many main reasons why K-pop is what it is today. Ernie, so much to chew on. Thank you so much. And a great foundation for us to continue this conversation. So I really appreciate that. Uh, Victoria, we're going to turn to you for question number two. Recently, we've seen a wider variety of Korean media gain a global foothold, not just in terms of format, but also in terms of tone and content. You wrote an article recently in the LA Times that says, quote, initially based on melodramatic storylines and Cinderella-esque tropes, Korean shows have matured in production quality, diversified in genres, and strengthened in plot, end quote. Can you talk a little bit about why these new, more complex messages resonate and how Korean media's viral quality has helped expand the reach to new audiences? And maybe you could talk about uh, some of the shows that you've re written about lately, such as Parasite and Squid Game, uh, which both have kind of an edgy and sharp social message. Over to you, Victoria. Yeah, so um, I think the, the most recent uh, viral phenomenon to really take the world by storm was Squid Game. And I think it was sort of a, a new stage of what's um, been long known in Asia as K-dramas. And Korean dramas have really been, um, was at the at the outset of this creation of the Hallyu wave. It was, you know, before any other medium, it was really what went beyond Korea's borders and, um, you know, got a foothold in Japan and China and in Southeast Asia. Um, and in the early days of Korean dramas, um, the, a lot of the analysis about Hallyu and like why it was having appeal, um, uh, had, had this kind of appeal in countries across Asia, talked a lot about how um, that compared to American media, there was like no sex and no violence. Um, and it had a lot of uh, family drama, uh, family values um, inherent in these storylines. And in, in many ways, it was quite formulaic. You could um, predict sort of how these storylines were going to play out, like who the villains were. Um, and, it, and, it, and that was sort of the basis uh, through which Korean dramas really got um, a, a foothold uh, in these parts. Um, but I think as television has, uh, as has, has happened with television everywhere in the world, um, with the arrival of streaming services and OTT services, it's really sort of like blown, uh, like, uh, uh, taken down boundaries on what television and these shows can achieve. Um, and it's really brought like cinematic talent and cinematic quality um, and budgets to these shows, which is really what happened with Squid Game. Um, and when it comes to the, the, the themes of inequality that have really been at the center of Squid Game and Parasite and the, and the global appeal that it's really had, um, that's been something I think for Korean society has always been um, a, a key part of Korean storytelling and in Korean tales, um, both in literature and movies and television shows. Um, and I think a part of that may be co come from the fact that South Korea is a, is a fairly small place um, where every, it's a very dense place where there's a lot of comparison with one another. 
there was actually a, a Korean idiom um, that if when your cousin buys a plot of land, your stomach hurts. <laughs> that's, that's sort of a longstanding Korean <laughs> um, idiom. And I think, and also because of uh, the recent history of Korea, the fact that everybody started out quite impoverished in the wake of the Korean War. Um, and everybody started, had this uh, um, starting point of not very much. And, and because of the meteoric rise of the Korean economy, the um, people's fortunes really diverged in a very uh, short period of time, which has led to, I think, a very acute and keen sense of inequality. And that's always been there in a lot of Korean cinema and Korean shows. Um, and I think, at, at a time when that um, type of storytelling was getting the kinds of budgets and reach and platform because of the foundation that was laid by the early days of the Korean dramas that were more formulaic, um, at, at a time when that format was really breaking open was a moment globally when there was this, I think, uh, worldwide a, a, a deepening sense of inequality and like a, a demand for that type of storytelling because of the um, widening global income gap and people feeling it more acutely in the uh, in the wake of the uh, the global financial crisis and and things like that. So I think it's it's sort of a confluence of those effects that the, the format had been evolving and because of its popularity and reach, the budgets had been growing, the production values have been growing, and it's become a lot more sophisticated both in terms of the acting and the production um, and the way it's marketed. And the themes that were always there, um, probably more strongly in cinema than, and than in Korean dramas that have really sort of merged to create this moment uh, that broke open in storytelling like um, Parasite and Squid Game. Awesome, really well said. Thank you, Victoria. And uh, you, one of the articles that I really enjoyed that you wrote was talking about the like semi-basement apartments, such as the one that we saw featured in Parasite, and what that means and what that signifies to a Korean audience that we might, outside of Korea, we might not know exactly what that means, but you provided a really great analysis. So I encourage people to check that out. Um, the next question goes to John Delory. Uh, so John, I wanted to ask you about your experience as an educator. So you've taught for over a decade in South Korea to a student base that has become increasingly international. From 2010 to 2019, the number of foreign students at Korean universities nearly doubled. And Hallyu has played no small role in attracting them to Korea. I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the impact of Korean cultural exports in terms of attracting these students, sustaining their interest, and then infusing them into the Korean culture. Uh, and then if we could go one level deeper, uh, what impact does this growing group of international students have then on Korean society? Well, thank you, uh, Jonathan, for having me. And uh, thank you for picking a question that requires um, no real knowledge on my part of the content. Of <laughs> um, basically, you know, I get I get the handouts from our eldest daughter, whatever she's listening to is my only sort of access uh, to, to what's hot. Um, and I couldn't even watch Squid Game uh, because it was too violent, uh, which sort of places me in the cultural universe here. But um, but I would, uh, you know, I do feel OK uh, having a small role here in terms of this question, because it has been very interesting um, for me as a as a professor at Yonsei University, and of course, probably everyone here in the audience um, has a rough sense, but just to be very clear, Yonsei is, I'm not trying to brag, just objectively is, you know, one of the most competitive and um, top, you know, sort of elite universities in the country. So that's very important to sort of caveat everything I'm saying with, with that. Um, but from that vantage point, it has been really um, fascinating for me and a learning experience because, you know, when I arrived, um, in 2010 to Yonsei to Korea, I would say in addition to not having a deep knowledge of, of um, pop culture, I also had a typical sort of academic, you know, uh, looking down on it. And it was really an evolution for me as I saw in this period that, that Bernie described for us as the, I guess that's the, um, the made by Korea. I mean, thinking about that timeline he laid out, you know, 2010, um, if you're a middle school or high school kid uh, in these parts, uh, literally all over the world, where the made by Korea phase is, is kicking in and fairly quickly, um, you know, those, those are 
rapidly students who apply to Yonsei and come to Yonsei. And so I've been sort of, um, while I've been here, I've been seeing um, that flow of students who are being reached, you know, at a, at a very receptive age um, when they're looking for something beyond what their home country and culture has to offer, certainly in the way I did when I was a kid and probably others uh, here all have. And they found something in the, the TV, in the film and in the music that really spoke to them, that, that drew them out. And we have a couple of theories, maybe I'll share some of mine later of, of what is that, that draw. Uh, and there's not one of them, but as an educator, what I've seen is a place like Yonsei has just benefited. I personally in my classrooms have benefited insanely over the last decade, because what I've seen is our students, and these are both undergrads and grads, uh, again, to Bernie's point, I teach in English. So these are students who have a very high level. Mostly they're not native English, but they're as good as native. They have very high levels of, of English as a second language where they can um, uh, perform at a, at a high college level. But then they're also either already know Korean or they're learning Korean. And when they're here, they're advancing that, that Korean uh, language skills. So we're really talking about like a trilingual group, minimum trilingual group. Um, and the, the, that they're coming from this K-pop in the broadest sense motivation, I've completely changed from seeing that, again, looking down on it a bit in my ignorance to really valuing that because that tends to mean that they come with a very strong motivation. They know why they're in Korea. Um, they're already taking the language seriously. They're learning more. Um, and they're the, you know, the kind of young person who really wanted to stretch themselves. Um, and, and, you know, to kind of close off, again, the geographic spread of this, I haven't really crunched the numbers, and this is not something I work on academically, so this is all anecdotal stuff for better or for worse, but I, I have seen from, you know, when I got here, um, a place like Vietnam, which is probably one of the best case studies, because it was already strong in terms of at the student level, I did see some numbers recently that Vietnam, I think is now one of the, maybe the largest um, foreign student group studying in Korea. Uh, maybe Jenna or others can correct me on that, but, and per capita, maybe the highest, um, which is really extraordinary. But I, I've seen that at Yonsei, um, that interest in that connection between Vietnamese culture and Korean culture translating into students coming here and our students going um, to Vietnam and obviously incredible business opportunities as well. But, you know, from Vietnam, Southeast Asia, um, Central Asia is a place where I'm seeing a lot in the last couple of years from the Stans, you know, Kazakhstan, um, sort of inner Asia and across to Europe. So the last thing I would say is the growth, especially the master's level in the number of students we're getting from Europe who are coming from this kind of K-pop um, interest has really transformed our classrooms and, and it um, allowed Yonsei to offer this kind of cosmopolitan education and experience uh, in Korea, which was the original goal of all these programs. So uh, the benefit is from an educational perspective, um, quite striking. Very cool. Thank you so much, John. And uh, I could share a, a similar story. Um, and I share your conclusion. We, uh, as the Korea study, gave the Van Fleet Award to BTS in recognition for their cultural contribution to US Korea ties. And at that time, we got a huge uptick in Twitter followers who were BTS Army, right? And so I thought uh, maybe they'll join for the annual dinner and then they'll, you know, leave afterwards. But they stuck around and in big numbers, and they're liking and retweeting and commenting on stories that have nothing to do with BTS or even arts and culture about the alliance, about Korea's middle power diplomacy. So I really enjoyed seeing them convert from, you know, initially just these fans of BTS who would like and comment on that sort of content. And now they're all over our stuff. So that was really cool to see. Uh, Jenna, I want to turn to you now. Uh, you've written uh, recently about this like very topic. So it, it's just perfect that you're joining us. Uh, and it, so more specifically, that's about South Korea's attempts to convert this soft power influence toward its diplomatic aims, including by mobilizing pop stars. So can you tell us a little bit about this approach? What do you think has worked and what hasn't? And if you were a consultant to the Blue House, uh, what might you suggest that they do? 
Yeah, well, I actually think the story you just shared is like the ideal scenario there, right? Where you draw people in because they're a fan of a certain artist or show or something like that, get their attention, and then, you know, convert that attention into other topics or keep them around, keep them interested, keep them learning more about, you know, Korea in a broader sense. So it's actually like a perfect segue, uh, that story you just told. Um, but just to step back for a moment, I think it's important to look at how South Korea sees its soft power as well. Um, so according to the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they conceive of soft power as having three pillars underneath it. They call it the public diplomacy pillars. And those are culture, knowledge, and policy. So culture is a lot of the things that we've been talking about so far, um, you know, pop culture, but it also includes things like food, even like hanbok, taekwondo, like things like that are under that umbrella of culture. Um, knowledge is things mostly like language learning. So the Korean government, for example, operates Sejong institutes in now more than 70 different countries. There's, I think, more than 200 Sejong institutes around the world um, where people can go in their local, you know, area and learn Korean. Um, and then finally, we have policy, uh, which is where I want to focus a little bit. Um, personally, I think this is because of my political science background and also being from the University of Chicago. If anyone knows about the traditions there in international relations, a little bit more skeptical of these things. Um, so I tend to define soft power a little bit more narrowly than what I just said with the three pillars. Um, and the reason I do that is because I think the way that soft power was originally thought of in international relations is that last um, pillar of policy. And then the other things, culture and knowledge, are resources that you can draw from to create that final goal of you know, supporting some sort of foreign policy um, or even economic goal. Or you know, there could be any number of goals, but there should be some sort of final goal. And then you cultivate things like you know, K-pop, you know, TV shows, uh, dra uh, dramas, movies, all the things we've been talking about, those are more like resources that you would draw from to, gr to get attention for whatever that goal is. So I, when I talk about soft power, I like to give a little bit more of that narrow definition because I think it's easy to say, you know, oh, Korea has great soft power, look at BTS, look at Parasite, but it's a little bit more complicated than that when it comes to you know, using soft power to support foreign policy, right? right. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I'll give you one example that is kind of my go-to example. I've studied it, um, and there are several others, but um, the example I want to give you of a successful soft power initiative from South Korea was um, the work surrounding the 2018 summit um, between President Moon Jae-in and, and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Um, in the months leading up to it, we saw, you know, first of all, the Olympics. There was a lot of really great work in inter-Korean relations going on with the Olympics. And sports diplomacy is a, another area that, you know, we're not touching on here, but is a big area for potential, you know, soft power um, cultivation and, and creating some of these goals. Um, so, you know, we had the, the great diplomacy that was going on um, with the Olympics. And then we saw this huge concert in Pyongyang, right, where you had uh, K-pop groups, um, Red Velvet went, so they're a very popular international uh, fan base. Um, and then you also saw, you know, a wide range of other South Korean singers who went um, and had this concert in Pyongyang. And, and then, you know, a number of other, like, events uh, before President Moon and uh, leader Kim Jong-un finally sat down at the end of April in 2018. And the reason I point to this as a really good example is because it had a very clear goal and it had a very clearly articulated goal. And that goal was to get attention and support for inter-Korean engagement and specifically surrounding the summit itself. So because there was something concrete and specific that, you know, the South Korean government could latch onto, their, their public diplomacy and their, the soft power aspect made sense and it kind of worked together and there was a, a cohesive narrative going on along with trying to draw in attention from fans of groups like Red Velvet, which I um, have written about this before. I think they pretty successfully did get that attention um, from fans uh, specifically related to that concert. 
So if I was giving advice, I think the main number one thing I say is you have to have a specific goal and you have to have a concrete reason that you're using these soft power resources and especially pop culture for that specific goal. Um, and not just you know throwing a, a K-pop group in there just to get more views, but having an actual reason that they're there and integrating them into a strategy that is related to that goal. Um, so I'll, I'll, there's plenty of other examples. Um, I'm sure that we can talk about this stuff more, but I think I'll stop there for now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jonah. Jonathan, yeah. Jonathan, can I jump in in the, in the spirit of spontaneity? and Absolutely. Uh, just quickly, because that's so interesting. Jenna's comments, I'm so glad we have the Chicago uh, school uh, now <laughs> part of the mix. Um, but, you know, hearing you talk about that, Jenna, it just reminded me of one of those moments where I don't think we ever fully processed, you know, in 2018, some of the things that happened. And, and you just reminded me of, and I wonder if you've written about this or have thoughts of, you know, you talked about sort of the South Korean government with this goal of influencing maybe in the U.S. and kind of global perceptions I suppose in South Korea as well, right? Um, and marshalling uh, a band like Red Velvet, you know, to me it was another interesting twist to that was Red Velvet was on the front page of Norong Shimun, you know? So in terms of also influencing the North Korean public and its perceptions to a degree that was kind of inconceivable, if, you know, if you had thought about it before, um, but then also kind of disappeared. Right. Um, and we hear lots of reports of the crackdown on, on K-pop um, ongoing uh, in, in North Korea. So anyway, it's another kind of interesting twist to that is actually trying to use um, K-pop to influence North Korean threat perceptions and general perceptions of the South. That's a great point. And yeah, uh, th two different avenues for trying to uh, influence North Korea and North Koreans, uh, this public diplomacy route um, exemplified by the Red Velvet concert, and then the, the more subversive way of uh, getting foreign media, including K-pop, K-dramas, K-movies in, into North Korea, uh, which of course the North Korean government actively tries to, to resist. So very different yeah, responses. I, yeah. If I may interject, I, I do think the unofficial ways in which South Korean pop culture goes into North Korea is, a, is probably like uh, poss possibly even more a powerful force. Um, if you talk to uh, North Koreans who have um, left North Korea and make their ways to China or South Korea, the, a lot of their perceptions about the outside world or what they came in, in uh, pursuit of when they left North Korea come from the media that's illegally smuggled across the Chinese border into um, into North Korea and a lot of uh, North Koreans in South Korea make concerted efforts to like send in USB discs with with that kind of information for it. so it in many ways those unofficial routes um, in terms of like exposure to South Korean capitalism or, or values or even just what Seoul looks like um, come from through this type of medium and um, in, in unofficial channels and I think that's a fascinating way um, it's changing or influencing North Korea, despite despite the government's um, right. harshest crackdowns. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely true. And we did a program with uh, Hyun In Ne. Uh, she is a Baksanim at Iwa University, and she was also uh, at Hanawon Jadon. She's she's a refugee from North Korea herself, and she said that the transition time that newly arrived refugees take in order to settle in South Korea has reduced so much because they already can do the South Korean dialect. They already know how to dress like a South Korean. They already know so much about South Korean culture. They've been exposed to it before. So I found that really interesting from, from her point of view. Okay. So we're going to, we get a lot of questions and I want to get to our audience questions. So we are going to go into a, a lightning round, faster round now, round two, faster, snappier answers. Uh, and we're going to go first to Bernie. Can you tell us about, a little bit about the convergence of the music industry's commercial aims and the Korean government's attempts to both promote Hallyu and utilize content for diplomatic aims? Yeah. You know, that's actually a kind of very tricky question, you know, for full disclosure, you know, I've been a recipient of a lot of government uh, funding and support over the years, I wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be able to do what I do and done what I've done without government support. Um, but with that being said, I think for me, the easiest way to perhaps maybe describe the relationship that the music industry has with the Korean government 
um, is sort of in our drive to go abroad and overseas and find success in new markets. Uh, in many ways, the Korean government is like having a passenger in the car. Um, best case scenario, the government sitting side by side with you riding shotgun is sort of the best <laughs> case scenario where they're supporting you and advising you. Um, but, you know, there's a worst case scenario where they're sort of leaning over and breathing down your neck like a backseat driver. And, um, you know, I think that uh, history, um, and especially recent history, has shown and proven that um, pop culture is very easy to tamper with. And it's really e it's very tempting to cross the line to use pop culture or K-pop music for political ways and means. Um, you know, unfortunately, um, because and then this is very important. Um, the K-pop culture industry, we're talking TV, film, music, video games, the K-pop culture industry is the second largest consumer export industry out of Korea. It is about a third the size of automobile exports, and surprisingly, it's about 1.5 times bigger than Korean electronics exports and nearly 2.5 times bigger than mobile phone exports. Wow. And so pop culture include, you know, and again, K-pop music is one of the drivers of this K-pop culture export boom, um, is a very attractive target. And so, for instance, when political tensions are rising, one of the easiest targets is unfortunately the K-pop culture industries for whether it's bans or boycotts and, and, um, and penalization, um, being penalized. And so, it really puts K-pop and K-pop culture front and center for both good reasons and for bad reasons. Um, and again, we have to remind ourselves is that when previous presidents have even attempted to um, puppeteer the artistic voices and the creative visionaries to suppress the freedom of expression and penalize those who don't subscribe to a certain political agenda, it's one of the main reasons we had a former president recently spend time in jail. Now, in terms of how it works and it works well, I think one of the most amazing things about the Korean government and what they've done for the K-pop culture industries, especially K-pop, is the amount of research that they do and provide for the Korean music and pop culture industries. We get a lot of rich data. We get a lot of robust analysis, which really helps us not only monitor trends, but really monetize trends. And again, it helps us more importantly translate sort of the busyness of fan culture into a bona fide global business. Um, you know, I think Jenna really hit a home run with when and where um, Korean music and diplomacy work well. Um, another example um, that I, I would love to highlight and point out is when BTS uh, rolled with Moon Jae-in's entourage to the UN last September. And again, a, a very clear agenda is at the UN, a lot of global issues and topics were gonna be raised and addressed. And Moon Jae-in to his credit was smart enough to bring BTS. And when BTS spoke about topics that not only politicians and citizens, but the youth of the world needed to know about, it had a very real impact. Um, and it, it was, it's so hard not to laugh, but you have to laugh. It's when Boris Johnson stepped up to the mic and he gave a speech to the UN. It only got 4,000 YouTube views. But the moment BTS stepped up to the mic, they dropped the mic. Their speech at the UN, which is equally as important um, as any other politicians, it got 6.4 million views in like a day or so, which for them is not much, but for the UN it was just <laughs> mind blowing. And so in terms of impact, in terms of, you know, a flex of soft power, I think that was a really good and really great example. Um, but on the flip side, there are times that I get concerned, I worry and maybe even cringe a little bit when sometimes when the Korean government um, is striking these deals around the world with different governments, whether it's a political or economic marriage, uh, there are times where I feel sometimes K-pop artists are gratuitously trotted out like basically wedding singers to sort of mark these momentous political economic occasions. And that makes me a little uncomfortable, honestly speaking. Um, but truth be told, um, you know, I think uh, the Korean government's support of the K-pop music industry, not only protecting and promoting the industries has really done wonders. And a lot of the success related to Hallyu, um, you know, we have to, uh, you know, give credit that the Korean government did very much have an important role. Um, but again, coming back to the car analogy, um, 
it's best when they're riding side by side shotgun. The last thing we want to do is have somebody behind us telling us where to go and what to do. So yeah. Thanks very much, Bonnie. <laughs> and you, you teased before this that inspiration struck you at a McDonald's restaurant and you made us wait to see exactly what the inspiration was. And that analogy, perfect. Perfect. Um, okay, so I want to turn now to Victoria. And Victoria, I'm going to ask you uh, about zombies, but I'm also going to throw in a, a couple of questions that we got from our audience members, just in case you have anything to say about this. No pressure. If not, we could pick up on it later. So your last article for the LA Times was about the prominence of the zombie genre in Korean movies and TV shows, Busan Hang and We Are All Dead. Uh, can you tell us why you think zombies have taken off in Korea and beyond and what the issue, uh, what social issue zombies reflects? And then if you want to pick up on this. We got, I'll, I'll throw in two questions here. Uh, so Jacqueline Meziani asks about the role of Korean literature in spreading Hallyu. Uh, and then, and, and with a particular emphasis on Korean uh, female writers and Korean Americans, such as Min Jin Lee. Uh, and then Judy Van Sile asks about dance, the role of Korean dance in spreading Korean culture abroad. So any one of those that you want to touch, and if not, we'll pick it up later. Over to you, Victoria. Well, um, when it comes to zombies, I have to say I'm I was the the furthest thing from a zombie flick aficionado, and I avoided watching any of them as for as long as I could. Um, but I, I was I kept noticing that there were more and more Korean zombie stuff, like movies, TV shows, um, and it it really seemed to um, resonate whenever there was one of these uh, Korean zombie flicks that and, and sort of the center of gravity of the zombie world seemed to be taken from the US to South Korea that, um, and the, and I, so as not a personal consumer of these things, I had it sort of explained to me by people who are, you know, uh, devotees or more practitioners of the zombie world in South Korea. Um, and the way that I think it, it again goes back to that theme of inequality that we've been seeing in things like Parasite and, um, and Squid Game and, uh, really blew over in a major way in the Netflix series Kingdom, which was set in the Chosun dynasty and it was a, it was a zombie flick. Um, and that sort of a lot of these uh, zombie storylines in South Korea are, they're less so a disaster story or a survival story, but actually kind of interested in the origins of how the zombies came to be. Um, in this show Kingdom, it, the origins of the zombies like come from, uh, you know, uh, starving regular people in South Korea sort of eating human flesh out of hunger. Um, mm -hmm. And that, there is, that there's a lot more sympathy towards the, um, the origins of the pandemic or the, uh, how it came to be. Um, Soul Station, which is an animated uh, uh, movie by um, the director of Hellbound, uh, Young Sang-ho, um, the the zombies that are initially featured in that uh, movie are like a homeless person and a runaway girl. And there's a lot of looking at using the zombie format as a vehicle to look at um, vulnerable parts of society and sort of, um, you know, using that as a, a method of telling the story of inequality that is sort of very present in a, in a lot of these uh, Korean stories. So I think that's something that's interesting about South Korea and that's a bit resonated. And I think a, a part of it is also the, the breaking down of the formulaic tropes that previously existed as the right. industry grows that there's just like more experimentation. Um, and this is one of the ones that have really taken off. Um, in terms of literature, I, I do think it is sort of like a, you know, a, a still as yet, I think there's a lot of um, effort being made, a lot of translations that are coming out and it, it sort of, at the, at, I think at the beginning of um, it truly becoming global with the interests of, with the man Booker going to Hangang and, and the new interest in um, Korean literature, I think it's probably at the cusp of becoming more known and uh, breaking open more. Um, something that is at the basis of a lot of uh, Korean shows and Korean movies is um, this, it's a, it's I think a very Korean format called the webtoon, which I think is also um, it's sort of sort of graphic novel, but not really. It's serialized. Um, it's not exactly comics. A lot of them are very cinematic and really beautifully drawn and could yeah. almost be like a storyboard for a movie. So right. it's not quite literature, but it is a format that's been really popular in Korea for the past like couple decades. And I think is 
making inroads elsewhere as well. Um, so I think that format is interesting. When it comes to dance, I am completely <laughs> ignorant. So I would probably, um, you know, <laughs> have better minds by Bernie to um, address that. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Victoria. Does anyone have anything to add on literature and dance before we move on? I, I could I could add on webtoons. Yeah, Jenna, please. Well, no, honestly, I was going to say, unfortunately, no, which I think goes to Victoria's point that it's maybe an underutilized um, resource here and that there, there have been a few moments in the last few years, particularly in literature, where there was kind of a big award or, you know, a big slash made by a particular author, a particular book, but then it kind of died down. So it is interesting that it hasn't become more of a sustained you know, part of the Korean wave. Um, and with dance, it's interesting, too. I feel like you know, there, there is some focus on more like traditional culture things. Like I mentioned, you know, the Korean government really wants to promote things like hanbok or Korean food and some more traditional forms of dance. I think the Korean government is very interested in including that as part of the Korean wave. They very deliberately include traditional culture there. Um, but for whatever reason, it hasn't necessarily become, you know, kind of the headliner um, in these conversations. Yeah, John. Yeah. And then Bernie. Okay, yeah, no, I was just going to reflect again the the old school middle aged uh, perspective on this. I mean, I'm sure cultural studies you would never say high low anymore, uh, and and I agree it doesn't work, and yet it is still kind of there, right? And and um, I think the the way in which we aren't already uh, talking about um, pachinko, Minjin Lee, or Hangang, or some of the other cases, or in terms of um, where there is incredible and, and uh, acknowledged literary um, kind of power and achievement, uh, but even more so, I don't know, in the, in the worlds of philosophy and thinking or in history, for example, I think there's a lot less of the crossover in what used to be called kind of the high culture. Um, maybe not so much, maybe in visual arts we can think of more, but, and then also the point I really want to make is how they're still kind of not connected. It's like, these are two different right. conversations, right? Yeah. And what we're talking about is really the, the, the pop culture driven phenomenon uh, yeah. without as much sort of crossover um, or, or some, that connection is for whatever reasons, not, not there as much as it should be. Excellent point. Uh, Bernie, I want to go to you. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to riff on, um, you know, what Victoria was talking about related to dance. Um, I think, you know, obviously the Korean government would love to support and see a little bit more spotlight on traditional dance. But, you know, one of the things that uh, Korea has been absolutely phenomenal on and we have to, you know, recognize and give props is um, Korean b-boys and b-girls are among the best uh, breaking dancers in the world. I mean, they're going to be contending for gold medals at the upcoming Olympics. And so when it comes to dance, um, we have to think a little bit bigger and wider in terms of what dance actually is. And so, you know, there are aspects in the dance world and sphere where Koreans are excelling on the global stage. And again, um, I just wanted to sort of throw out there, you know, Victoria nailed it when, um, when we talk about literature we're not just talking about books, but webtoons. Yeah. I mean, right now, webtoons has been the IP gold mine for the Korean TV and film industry. Mm -hmm. And um, again, we need to see, we have to maybe recontextualize and maybe redefine in terms of what literature is. We have to treat possibly maybe webtoons or comic books as being another form of, uh, of literature. That's a great point. And uh, as a Korean language learner, at uh, Ohakdang, at Seoul Day and Go Day. Sorry, John, I didn't go to Yonsei. Uh, but we loved us. Sorry, <laughs> we a great reputation. Uh, but I wasn't up to the task. We loved using webtoons as a form of study uh, because it's entertaining, it's fun, and, and you really learn a lot about colloquial speech that you're not going to get in the textbooks. Uh, and then on the point, of, uh, the point about literature, uh, if we look at some of the breakout books, like The Vegetarian by Hong Gong, so much of the emphasis goes on the quality of the translation is so, so important here. And this is something that Bong Joon-ho talks about as well. I uh, remember his Oscar acceptance speech. We have to get over that, that little two inch barrier at the bottom of the screen, the subtitles. Um, but the quality of those subtitles and the quality of the translation is so, so key to really 
preserve what is the essential allure of that cultural product and make it saleable to a wider audience. It's a really, really tricky thing to do. Um, but I, I think Korea is getting really, really good at it, and that explains some of their success. Jenna, over to you now. Back to our regularly scheduled programming. Uh, where do you think geographically the most fertile soil is for the Korean smart power approach? Is it in consolidating our existing alliances? Is it countries like Japan sort of help smooth over some tensions? Is it looking for new partners, kind of helping the new Southern policy in Southeast Asia uh, or even inter-Korean relations? Where, where do you think that it's working really well? Yeah, so one thing I think it's really important to remember is that soft power is not a silver bullet in any way. Um, and we can't talk about it like soft power can smooth over or fix relations when there are very legitimate reasons that some countries have different interests, um, especially when it comes to, to certain issues. So, um, you know, soft power can supplement existing policy. It can support a relationship that's already, you know, doing at least okay. Um, but it's not going to turn things completely around for countries that have a rocky relationship. So um, the Obama administration actually had a really hard time with this. Uh, the Obama administration invested a lot into public diplomacy and kind of creating better ties with the Middle East during his uh, time in the White House. And it was just completely undermined by the facts on the ground and US policy, particularly military policy. So when those when the policy that people are seeing and the way that they're being, you know, talked to by, you know, public diplomacy um, experts or even, you know, pop culture, things like that, when those are just completely divergent, there's not a whole lot you can do. Um, so when it comes to South Korea, you know, th relationships with countries like Japan, for example, I mean, the two sides have divergent understandings and interests, especially when it comes to historical issues. And I think it would be, you know, better for them to focus on finding a middle ground and working through those things in a more traditional tr government to government diplomatic setting, you know, versus a, a soft power way to kind of, you know, try to, to move past these very sticky and, and difficult issues. Uh, instead, I think you mentioned a couple of these areas, you know, ASEAN, South Asia, middle, even the Middle East and Latin America, because those are places where uh, Hallyu is particularly popular, but Korea as, you know, kind of its soft power strategy hasn't necessarily focused on. So those places where you already have a lot of resources, you have fans, you know, already there waiting um, and could actually be a new fertile ground for the South Korean government to explore, that's where I would recommend going. Very good point. Uh, and one follow-up question from our audience, Candace Epps Robertson asks, how do we measure the effectiveness of the soft power approach? It, it's so difficult, right? Because we're talking about qualitative, largely qualitative impact, uh, but are, any initial thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I think the State Department would love to know that too. Like if I had the answer to that, I could be like very high up immediately in, the, in any bureaucracy, basically, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. There, there's practitioners who've been doing this for a very long time and even they struggle with, yeah. you know, even, you know, programs that we run, educational programs or things like that. There are other types of public diplomacy. It's, it's very hard to, to measure concretely, you know, did this change someone's mind about, Korean foreign policy? Did it change their mind about US foreign policy? Is that even really the goal? Or are you just trying yeah. to inform people? So going back to a part of my original point, which is I think having concrete goals also helps with the measurement because you're, what are you measuring? Are you measuring a change of opinion? Well, it depends on what your goal was. Are you measuring, you know, just increased knowledge or increased interest over time? Right. You know, if that's your goal, that's that's great, but that changes how you're going to try to measure it, or at least, mm -hmm. yeah, attempt to do so. Right. Um, and the last thing I'll say, just very quickly, is I think part of the problem is these are these are very political conversations, right? Like any politician who's in the blue house for five years, for example wants to be able to say, you know, in my tenure, I invested in these programs and and I got X Y Z outcome. Right. 
right. but, but that's not the timeline that a lot of these things work on, right? This could be years or decades in the making when you cultivate a, a generation of people who are learning Korean, who are interested yeah. in Korean studies, yeah. studying abroad. It could be decades before you see any of the fruits of that. So that's one you know, problem too, is I think politicians want an, a quick response of what did this change, but it doesn't work like that. Very good point. Uh, any other thoughts on that topic before I move on? Next, I'm going to ask John about China and about Hangul. Yeah, Bernie. Uh, I, I feel like I'm in school because I have to raise my hand. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think when it talks about, you know, how do we measure the impact of K-pop culture in politics? Um, you know, we have two examples recently that actually were not driven by the government, but driven by the fans and had a huge, deep uh, impact on politics. And the two examples um, would be um, during the Black Lives La uh, Matter movement, uh, what K-pop fans, particularly what a lot of BTS Army fans were doing to rally around and for the cause, not just in terms of donations, um, but the fact that uh, through platforms like TikTok, they completely punked Donald Trump into thinking he had a packed house in one of his rallies. And it turns out that uh, the K-pop fans, you know, pretty much catfished him with a lot of, you know, fake ticket uh, reservations. Um, and then just not too long ago, a few weeks ago, or, or recently um, in December, um, you had a very charismatic uh, presidential candidate in Chile, uh, uh, Claudio Patin, um, uh, a student protest leader, uh, Gabriel, Gabriel Boric, who actually won the presidency of the Chile elections. Chile elections. And one of the reasons he won is he made it known he was a K-pop fan and K-pop fans rallied around and, and, and got him into office. And so, um, you know, it's, it's hard to measure the soft power, but, you know, for the time being, um, just measuring social media analytics and how that has, you know, transferred and transformed in the political space is something worth watching, sometimes worth worrying and, and, and sometimes worth laughing at and laughing with. Thanks, Bernie. Um, okay, John, let's talk about China. Let's talk about the Olympics. Uh, because as we recently saw, cultural issues can bring countries together, but they could also cause some friction, right? So talking about the, the Hanbok episode in the Olympics. Uh, and then I'll, I'll add another question. This one comes from J Bum Kim, who asks, how do you think we can make use of the Korean alphabet Hangul to influence people around the world? So how, how does Korean language um, play a role here. So just in case you have thoughts on that one and, uh, and the first one, China and Hanbok. Yeah, well, I might punt the second one. That's really interesting, but maybe others have, have more insight on that. Um, on the China piece, it, it maybe two points I'd make. Um, one is slightly different, but it, but it picks up on a, a lot of um, points that, that others have made, which is, you know, one of the core questions here is the relationship, sort of the proper relationship between culture and the state, you know, and how do governments um, not be the backseat driver, but support, um, be a good patron. But I think actually the contrast between China and Korea is quite instructive. Um, I mean, China is a good example of, you know, destroying the meal uh, by, by boiling all the vegetables until there's nothing left in them, you know, by flooding um, the cultural zone with patronage, with state support, that also comes um, with, with very clear lines about what you can say and what you can't. Um, and so you see how, I think there's also something else going on that's quite interesting. Again, an instructive contrast between China and Korea um, in that it's almost the inversion of what Bernie described. Uh, the dates don't quite work, but China, I think in cultural terms is going from made by China uh, made in China to now made for China. So you can see this, for example, I think maybe Victoria, you wrote about this, but the recent Korean war film, right? Um, yeah. On the battle of Changjin in China yeah. was evidently, you never know for sure if people are really watching it. <laughs> evidently a blockbuster hit yeah. in China, but who's watched that? I mean, I haven't right. even seen it yet. Outside of China, no one's watching it. Um, contrast that with Parasite or, or Squid Game. Yeah. So the two are really moving in these complete opposite directions. Uh, and it goes to the point about if, you know, there's this paradox where if, if Korea or other countries want to maintain this sort of cultural 
it's not quite power, but allure, which at with with in in specific instances they can maybe leverage. They have to keep their distance from uh, from the cultural creators, you know, and provide the freedom. For if you think about some of the big hits, going back even to Gangnam Style, the Korean stuff is ironic. It's laughing at Korean culture or harshly criticizing. Yeah, I mean, those of us who live here know Parasite is not yeah. satire. Right. Yeah. These are harsh, harsh critiques of inequality in South Korea, at the kinds of cultural you know, space that's not allowed in China. And therefore, Chinese stuff doesn't resonate anywhere. Yeah. So um, maybe I should stop there. I didn't really answer your question, which is about the Olympics. But <laughs> I, I can comment on that, too. But I'm worried about time, Jonathan. But that has to do with sort of bilateral you know, dynamics that have really changed between Korea and China, but, but I don't want to take more time than I should. No, that's, that's fascinating. I think th that's a great point and it really d explains the difference, but I will give you a little space here if, if you do have any thoughts about the Han book and what happened there. I can do the, the 30 second, um, okay. which is 60, uh, you know, it, because I did 15, 20 years ago I, in the early two thousands, I was spending a lot more time in China and it's interesting to look back on how it's changed. You know, back then, I, I would say there was a lot more warmth uh, at tour, and admiration in Chinese circles toward South Korea. South Korea was a kind of model for many, say, younger uh, Chinese people, you know, the students that I was interacting with. And it was because South Korea was, of course, wealthier, which it's not quite anymore, certainly not like it used to be if you're middle class Chinese. Um, 20 years ago, there was a big gap and there's really not um, now. And also the politics have changed. You know, South Korean democracy was something that was held up as kind of a model as sort of the like, well, when we get there, we'll be more like uh, Korea. Yeah. And the political dynamics have not really changed here, but they have changed in China. I think there's less of that yearning, frankly. Um, and then, you know, lastly, the, the traditionalism which I think was stronger in Korean culture, uh, um, you know, 15 years ago, that appealed a lot to the kind of post-cultural revolution Chinese people who yeah. were sad that they had destroyed so much of their own culture and admired in Korea yeah. this continuity of traditionalism. I think now Korea is criticizing a lot of its traditionalism, particularly in terms of gender. And we see that reflected in, in the culture. Um, and China has just moved on, you know, to a different kind of space. And so um, I, I think from the, I think we're more familiar with the South Korean resentments towards China and obviously the Thad issue, which we haven't discussed, but Bernie might want to say something directly affected this industry. Um, so that created a lot of ill will. So it's kind of obvious the reasons for increasing negativity toward toward China in South Korea. Um, but I, and, and so that's kind of manifesting in the world of the Olympics and sport and, and with the Hanbok. Um, but I, I think maybe the part I could add is a little bit more on the Chinese side of how the whole sort of meaning of Korea, South Korea as something to admire and aspire to has really, I think, changed over the last decade plus. That's a really interesting point. And then, of course, South Korean views towards uh, China have also changed a lot, especially in, in the last couple of years, according to the surveys that we say. Um, okay, so we're going to now transition into the super lightning round. So let's try to do a minute answers because your time is precious. And I want to get to as many questions and audience questions as we possibly can. Uh, so Bernie, let's go to you from an audience demand perspective. What are any new geographic regions that are emerging as potential big bases for K-pop fandom? And then if you have anything to say about j Bum's question about Hangul, please uh, fire away. Yeah, I mean, for me, uh, the answer is pretty straightforward. It's we just look at the analytics, we look at the data that's coming in and, and from what we can tell and from what I can see um, from you know monthly, weekly, daily analytics, uh, the emerging markets for K-pop, I would say, is um, more of Europe, uh, the Middle East, parts of Africa, and surprisingly, uh, India. Uh, we're seeing a huge surge in interest um, and, and fan fervor um, from India. Uh, again, recently, Spotify not only, not only opened here in Korea, but also in India. And K-pop has emerged as one of the top five music genres in India. And near the top of the most popular artists as a whole 
in India are acts like BTS and, and Blackpink. Um, so it's really interesting to see where K-pop is spreading in places that I just would have never imagined five, 10, 15 years ago. Um, and then to answer the second question, you have to remind me again, Jonathan, what it was. Just about Hangul, the role of Hangul and oh, Korean oh, language. Hangul? Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big believer on keeping language integrity. And so for instance, not just myself, but many others in the industry, when um, there was a push in the early 2010s to export um, Korean and the Korean language and Hangul, I think in many ways was a very important aspect and element in the exports. Um, in the sense that when you, again, you look at the artist's names, album titles, song titles, music video titles, uh, more often than not, you will see Hangul and English side by side. Because I think the moment you strip the Korean language from the marketing, the promotions, and the packaging of a Korean pop culture product, you're in many ways stripping the identity. So I think it really needs to go hand in hand. Um, there's no need to drop the Korean for the sake of selling more to sell out. It, you can do both. And again, this is something that um, other consumer goods and products and services have done. If it works for cars and electronics or coffee, it should work for music, movies, TV shows, and, and video games as well. Right. Great point. Thank you, Bernie. Okay, Victoria, over to you. Uh, looking into the future, what do you think the emerging regions, content, and platforms that will define the next phase of Hollywood? Um, man, only if I had a crystal ball. Um, I do think there is it, there is sort of this demand, I think, always, um, I guess, I don't know if it's in the industry or the government, when there is like a, a big uh, breakthrough uh, trend, it's how do you create the next Gangnam Style? How do you create the next BTS? How do you create the next um, Squid Game? And, and I do think it's it seems like a bit of a foolhardy exercise that's like trying to capture lightning in a bottle. And the, the beauty of these things that, that happened the way that it did is, is from a lot of the creative energy that happened quite organically. Um, I do think I'm, I'm still interested in seeing like Korean dramas further evolve because I do think it's a format that is um, incredibly popular uh, across Asia. It hasn't quite fully um, taken a foothold elsewhere. And I do think it's, it is sort of, expanding and evolving in terms of like the the themes that it's discussing the values that it's uh, channeling and it, and it used to be I do think that in the formulaic uh, uh, tropes of um, Korean dramas of past that they were rather reinforcing of you know things like gender norms or certain uh, family dynamics um, and I do think there is a lot of room for that to change and to evolve um, like you know what what it can do in terms of like LGBTQ issues or even things like feminism, I'd be really interested in, to, in trying to, in seeing where, where that goes and how that evolves. So. Excellent point. You have really good uh, sharp tip of the spear in terms of what's, what's new and upcoming in uh, Korean culture as we could look to the cultural products. Uh, okay, so uh, ne next question I'm gonna ask about the limits of soft power. It goes to John first and then Jenna. Uh, quick shout out to our two audience members who asked about this very question, Cheryl Weller and Pavitra Pai. Thank you very much, Cheryl and Pavitra for asking this question and, and also just uh, paraphrase. So uh, what are the opportunities and the limits for Korean smart power? What kinds of diplomatic and security wins can a country expect to get? And this is something that Jenna talked about a little bit uh, before you know, about setting realistic expectations. So John, any thoughts that you have on this and, and then back to Jenna for any additional thoughts? Yeah, well, I wanna hear what, um, what Jenna has to say, but I guess one, um, one area we haven't delved into very much um, is history. And I mean, that's my yeah. primary academic uh, discipline is as a historian, um, it kind of strikes me in thinking about our discussion and then listening to it. This is, you know, someone, I think Jenna brought it up in terms of Korea-Japan um, uh, ties and it's part with, with China and, and just generally you can say across Northeast Asia, there has been very little progress on the past. Uh, the past is getting worse, basically, and the um, the mutual misunderstandings about the past are are getting worse. And so um, I, that's probably where I would go in terms of where we see the limits of this. And I'm not sure that, um, again, if I were advising the government, I would uh, emphasize the limits of what 
um, they can do besides being supportive. Um, but it, it, this would be a project, not just for historians, but certainly including historians, um, but also those in the cultural realm who can express historical realities right. in ways, for example, that Japanese readers or yeah. content consumers could get a better understanding of the, of the facts of the history and the meaning of the history for something like the comfort women issue. Um, yeah. That's obviously an area where it's failed, you know, and all of this yeah. K-pop wave has had zero. It, again, it's kind of like two different things happening yeah. uh, simultaneously. So that would, I guess it speaks to the limits, um, but also an area, if, if I were dreaming, where could this go next? Uh, that's where I would love to, to see it in a cosmopolitan way, not in a Korea centric way. Yeah. And there's, you know, uh, these attempts at joint history textbooks, uh, Korean and Japanese scholars work together, really struggled. There's in the works a Korean dictionary being created by joint North and South Korean scholars, linguists. So that's a really interesting project, which I, I think continues to go on. It's been going on for years. Um, but they, they'll have to face some really interesting questions about the way that the two languages have divided. But any thoughts about, uh, from my perception, there's been a it's been a tough going to get these joint history textbooks off the ground. Is that the place where we see this going or could these issues be addressed uh, more easily perhaps in uh, a cultural product like a movie or a webtoon or a drama? Well, I would just, again, I want to hear Jenna. I would just say on this both um, I've, I've not been involved, but I've, I've followed, I guess, some of those projects um, and they're, they're worth trying, but a textbook is probably not, uh, the way to do it. And, you know, textbooks can often be lowest common denominator type of history um, to begin with. So, and this stuff is too, too difficult, too sensitive, um, I think, to approach in, in that kind of systematic textbook yeah. um, paradigm. But I think including historians is absolutely crucial uh, because, you know, again, if we take the probably the hardest one is um, the Korea-Japan uh, colonial history and the, and the legacy. Some of the best historical work is by Japanese historians who have gone into the archives in Japan and brought to light uh, mm -hmm. documents and, and facts of the colonial legacy. So the collaborative nature of it, just like I think Bernie was talking about collaboration among artists, the collaboration among historians who, who generally hate the nationalism that's at the, the original sin of our field and are happy to find opportunities to work against it. I think historians absolutely have a place there and will bring the rigor of, of what we know about the past, but it's not enough. You know, the textbook approach is not enough. And I do think that bringing the cultural um, sphere in, you know, uh, is, is absolutely critical to the process of then getting people to get to a new understanding of the past. So really good points. Um, Jenna, let's turn over to you. What are the limitations of a soft power approach that we should sort of be aware of? Yeah, so I, I want to take us back a little bit to, you know, just always ground this in what what is soft power, right? And soft power is defined as the opposite of hard power. That's where it came from was we talk too much about hard power and in international relations, you know, Joseph Nye, I'm going to create this new concept. And he was deliberately creating that concept to say there's something other than this. There's something other than military, purely economic, you know, coercive power. So now, you know, on the flip side, almost now that we're thinking about what is soft power, I think there is a realm where military, economic, um, hard power things are just going to that that's what we're talking about right if you're talking about security I mean at the end of the day some of these security issues there's not really going to be room for more of a soft power approach because you know states in the international system sorry to be too too IR about it but states in the international system they want to survive right that's the ultimate goal and so if security and if survival is at state in the the health and you know, of their people is at stake, they're not going to mess around with any of this soft power stuff. So there are places where it's just out of question. And then there are places where, you know, it is more of a cultural conversation and people to people and education and things like that. It's purely kind of a soft power conversation. But then there's these really interesting gray areas where I think smart power comes in. That's the idea of smart power. 
Um, Bernie brought up a great example with uh, BTS going with President Moon to the UN. The main goal there, one of the main things they were talking about was sustainable development goals and trying to you know, find more support for Korea's development aid projects and, and support for development in general. And so is that a place where you can say, okay, it's kind of economic to some extent, it's not purely economic, but then you can bring in people like BTS whose fans you know, already do a lot of charity work actually on their own. And maybe we can find a place where that marries naturally right in the middle. Yeah. Right. right. So that's what I'll kind of say is it's it's finding the places where like it, it makes sense for this to be a hard power conversation and it makes right. it sense for this to be a soft power conversation and then a smart power conversation <laughs> somewhere in the middle. <laughs> really great point. I, I, I tend to think of like Maslow's needs hierarchy. Remember that in psychology class, if you yeah. uh, get your basic security satisfied, then you're able to go to the, the next rungs. And so if you have your basic, uh, you know, security concerns uh, sort of taken care of, then you can go on to more of a soft power pursuit and pursuing diplomatic games that way. Um, I want to give everyone a final chance for any final thoughts or parting words. Before I do so, I want to thank uh, a couple of our other audience members whose questions I did not ask, but I think the topics of these questions have come out organically through other parts of the conversation. So that's Lucas Zumbush, Catherine Newsom Her, John Krishna Pineda. Thank you so much for your questions. And I think we kind of touched on them. If not too much, then I'm sorry. We'll uh, keep, keep asking. We'll get to them next time. Um, so let's go around any final thoughts any last things that you want to say we'll start with victoria bernie jenna and john uh i it, i think it's been a very varied and a very uh fruitful discussion and i i have um i do think in in many ways uh compared to you know like bernie or jenna i'm, I'm i am a very casual observer slash student slash consumer um, of this, and I'm, I'm as surprised and blown away uh, by what the evolution that I've seen in, in my lifetime, and I'm somebody who grew up in South Korea consuming um, K-pop beginning in the 90s, so um, it's been interesting, and, and uh, to hear uh, all of your analysis has been really interesting. Thanks so much, Victoria. Appreciate you. Going over to Bernie. But no, it's actually been a huge honor and pleasure for me to, to be sitting here because um, it's actually nice to see and hear uh, the faces and the voices of people I, whose works I, I read regularly. So that was really nice. And again, one of the beauties of doing these things live and having a stream on YouTube is I've been having the darting eye line to see what the IRL, as the kids say, real time uh, comments were. And uh, somebody did properly call me out. I had accidentally mispronounced uh, President Kim's uh, name. It's Kim Dae Jung, not Kim Dae Jung, um, but I didn't get my caffeine boost this morning that I usually get. <laughs> well, forgive um, you. But, you know, but yeah, but, but that being said, I think, you know, um, one of the things that I, I really want to emphasize is that I've seen a lot of sort of um, theories out there in terms of why Korea's soft power is so successful and has had such an impact and has such an influence. And I just really want to put out there that I've kind of seen a bit of a, a false narrative and a little bit of a misinformation in this assumption that in some way, shape or form that the Korean government is driving or controlling or behind this um, pop culture soft power move. Uh, it's not, if anything, it's been very organic and it's been really the government supporting, and I can't emphasize enough, uh, the, the blood, sweat and tears of entrepreneurs. And I think that's something that we really need to emphasize and highlight is the fact that if it wasn't for the entrepreneurial spirit of a lot of the creatives in the various pop culture industries and pop culture companies and pop culture field, uh, we wouldn't be here today. Um, but again, it's government support. It's not some sort of five, 10 year master plan that they mapped out and executed perfectly. Um, I mean, it's very much a work in progress. God knows there've been for every hit, there's been a lot of misses, but uh, the most important thing is, is that um, definitely working in the field in the pop culture industries, we do have those direct lines of communications um, to hopefully take things further and farther. Cool, thank you so much, Bernie. And yeah, really well stated about that, that synergy, uh, but the drive coming from the entrepreneurs and the artists. Um, over to you, Jenna. 
Yeah, I think um, I just want to, uh, you know, plus one everything to, that Bernie just said. Um, I think it's really interesting, especially in the media. And this is understandable, but um, you kind of want to look for like, what's the secret? What's the like secret sauce? And how did Korea do this? Um, and sometimes the answer is, number one, it's complicated and a lot of people put in a lot of time and blood, sweat and tears. And then also like the content is kind of good. Like it's really good, you guys. Right. <laughs> it's fun. It's interesting. There doesn't have to be some like sinister secret behind it. Like people like it because it's it's good and it's fun and entertaining um, and because it resonates with them. A lot of the messages, you know, we talked about zombie movies. We talked about these these products that are resonating with people. So, um, so on that side, I will definitely completely agree with that. Um, and then similarly on the soft power side, I think, you know, there's a tendency to want to simplify it to say, you know, Korea is so popular right now. Korea has all this popular culture, therefore they have soft power. Um, and, you know, I want to complicate that narrative and say that it's a, it, takes a little bit more strategizing and it takes a, a couple more steps there to really tie those really amazing resources and the interest in Korean pop culture to, you know, a specific goal. Um, and it can be done, but there are limitations as we've talked about. So um, just thinking about it more carefully and thinking about where are those places where the Korean government can and should, I mean, that was brought up as well. How, how much should they be really involved? That, that is an open question still too. Well, thank you so much, Jenna. You've both grounded us in this realist orientation, but then helped us soar with this like <laughs> fandom that you're so enthusiastic about. So I think that just, that just worked perfectly for this program. Uh, okay, John, over to you. Well, I don't have much to add. Thank you for letting me ride the coattails. Of this <laughs> I learned a lot. Um, I guess I would just very quickly kind of along those lines. I mean, at the end of this conversation, it's left me not wanting to use the word soft power and smart power uh, much uh, in the sense that, you know, the danger there is it puts um, culture and, and the freedom and creativity, and again, irony, self-mockery, self-questioning that's behind good entertainment and great art, uh, it, it hitches all of that to you know what John Mearsheimer is going to talk about in, in Jenna's next section, <laughs> to, to IR, to the power of the state, to these goals that that states that governments are trying to achieve. It it nationalizes it all. You know, it makes it a conversation about Korea and Japan, Korea and China, yeah. and so it actually really sort of traps our thinking in a lot of pitfalls that. Um, artists and cultural creators at, at a pop level, precisely why we love them, what they do is they get us out of that stuff. They liberate us from that stuff. So yeah. I think I think we all agree that there's um, there's a real, um, uh, the, the limits are probably more important than anything. To me, that's kind of the takeaway and a, and a point we all from our different perspectives seem to agree on that um, any government, including the Korean government, while being supportive really needs to know when to just stop and let it be and let it go and see what happens. Excellent point and a great dose of perspective for us to just zoom out and look at this from, from a bird's eye view and uh, a great note to end our program today. So thank you so much for all of our viewers. Uh, thank you for our speakers who stayed overtime. Uh, to answer all the great questions that we did get from our audience members. We really, really appreciate it. This has been so nourishing and, and enjoyable for me. And I specifically like this sort of organic flow. And, you know, one thing kind of led to the next. And it, it definitely went places that I could not have anticipated. And that's thanks to your fantastic contributions, both our speakers, of course, and also our uh, audience members who sent in some awesome questions. Please join us on March 7th for Korea's presidential election forecast and impact analysis. We'll be joined by Michelle Yihi Lee from the Washington Post, Carl Friedhoff from the Chicago Council, Jungmin Kim from NK News, and Dr. Katrin Fraser Katz, the Korea Society's Van Fleet non-resident senior fellow. Look forward to seeing you for that and other stuff coming up at the Korea Society. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hope everybody has a great night. Bye, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.